All right. Hi, welcome. Um, yeah, so we got uh, actually most people are here now. So as I was saying before, you know, feel free to interrupt any time if, um, if I've had some problems, uh, if you can't see my desktop. Uh, if you have any questions, shout them out. So um, as usual, you know, I, I, I can go ahead and start talking about things and um, and we'll see if that prompts some questions for people. So I'm, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about the problem set too, make sure everybody kind of knows what needs to be done on that. Um, and then uh, we'll probably also get started with the programming assignment too as well here. So I can start talking about that a bit as well. Um, so let's look at the problem set here. So as usual, the problem set uh, you'll find that under the, uh, the first unit, the unit three here. Um, I'll just go ahead and open it up. So there's uh, two questions here. The first one I do ask you to do a diagram. Um, so, you know, chapter three is all about processes and operating systems and about the, you know, so that we go, we work, work through the, um, like the three state or the two state, the five state and the seven state process model. Uh, let me open up my textbook here so we can look at that figure here. So, So in chapter three, so, so yeah, I mean, there's there's the the two state, uh, and then the uh, so these are the kind of important diagrams and the five state process model. Um, you know, so our second program assignment, we're basically going to be implementing kind of a simulation of the process of, of a um, a dispatcher uh, that keeps track of multiple processes and moves them through the main three states. Um, so, um, so the um, problem set uh, is asking you to, the, the first problem is, is asking to draw a queuing diagram similar to the one in figure 3.8b, but for the, for the full seven state process model. So, um, um, so here's the, you know, here's the three, figure 3.8 that I'm referring to, um, you, you know, uh, hopefully if, if you're using an older version than the ninth edition, um, this is probably still the same figure number, but if not, this is the one that I mean here in that question. So, so you ought to have a diagram that's kind of the same here, but also um, gives a similar indication for, you know, so, so here it's really only concentrating on the, the three or five main states. So the, you know, ready, running and uh, blocked. Um, and it's kind of indicating uh, that we might, for example, have separate event queues, se separate queues for each different kind of way that a process might be blocked. So, so you know, to, to extend this for the full seven, you also have to keep, you have to um, um, extend that to, uh, let's see, where's it talk about the seven state model? Uh, yeah, down here, so in figure 3.9 here. Um, in particular, you know, we add in um, suspended states here, ready suspended, block suspended. So, so think about that, but, but yeah, I kind, of, I kind of want a diagram that looks sort of like this, but extended to uh, where we have block, where we have suspended processes, okay? And um, let me just do kind of a quick thing here because I know, I mean, people get confused sometimes uh, in this class, reading the textbook, the, the difference between something being blocked versus it being suspended, okay? So when, when a process is blocked, it um, is, uh, it, it's still in memory. So, so uh, it, it's been allocated memory um, and, and that memory holds all the code and data um, for the process that's being run. We're, we're, it's just currently not in a ready state. It's waiting for some event before um, it can get back to a state where it would be possible to run it, right? So the typical block state is, you know, it, it needed to do some IO. So it needed to read something from a hard drive, for example, or write something to a hard drive. Um, and it can't proceed to the next, in, to, to execute the next instruction until that read or write is finished. Okay, so that, that'll be blocked, right? Now, process suspension um, is, is, is a medium level 
um, scheduling decision here. So sometimes if memories become overloaded, we might select one or more processes to be suspended. And what, what that really means is we're going to kick it out of memory. So we're going to deallocate any memory that was allocated for it. We're going to save it back to secondary stories. So, so typically, you know, if, if we suspend a process, we will write out its current state to a hard drive. Um, then will be suspended. So we, the sus process suspension, as is discussed in this chapter a little bit, is mostly a resource management issue. So since main memory is so important for um, running processes and for um, um, making certain that uh, we utilize the CPU well, um, sometimes if memory is overloaded, we, we got more demand for memory than we have, we need to temporarily kick some processes out. So they're not really active anymore. They're suspended um, to free up a bit of memory so that other things can run more smoothly. All right. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, in, in the full kind of um, seven state process model here, as we show in 3.9b, uh, we can have a, we have states corresponding to ready or blocked, uh, but for processes that have been kicked out of memory that have been suspended. So this is, this is called suspending a process. Um, it's also called swapping process. That basically means the same thing. So, all right. But yeah, I should see something like this, but extended for the seven state model. Any questions on that first? Um, Problem from problem set. Um, if not, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about the second problem set. This, this one, the, the second problem is really important. So we're going to be revisiting this one also in the next unit where we talk about um, um, concurrency issues with the uh, um, concurrent process execution or, or th uh, uh, process threading, things like that. So um, the first thing that I wanted to mention is um, you can actually run this code. Um, so I wanted to mention the examples subdirectory. I don't have my dev box running here, but let me go ahead and start it up. So I'm, I'm in my OS sim repository directory. So I'll do the normal vagrant up to bring up my dev box. Um, and um, might not quite be up yet here. Probably still waiting on it. So um, so yeah, again, you know, um, so far, this is what you would normally expect when you're doing a normal uh, bringing up of your virtual um, dev box. So you should see it forwarding the port 8080. Uh, later on, you should see that the um, um, that the shared folders are correctly being mounted and shared between host and guests. And uh, usually it's a little bit quicker than this. I don't know if I'm having a problem at the moment or not here. Um, so let's see here, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll give it another minute here, but let me go back to the problem set question. Um, so in the second question, I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this while I'm kind of waiting for the dead box, see if that'll come up. Okay, so um, you know, chapter four is about threading, which is why I put this question in here. Um, but we're going to, like I already mentioned, we're going to be coming back to this question when we talk about concurrency. So it's, it's, a, it's an example of a particular concurrency issue is what's going on in this question. If you're not familiar with, with writing a threaded program, let me just give you the basics. So we're using a library um, on, on, that's common on Unix and Linux and POSIX-based systems called pthreads. So by including pthread.h header file, uh, we have functions like pthread create, um, and we have data types, uh, basically structures defined like uh, the pthread underscore t here. So, you know, you don't really have to know all the details of how this works, but basically what happens is if you compile and run this program typically um, on a system, what what the operating system does when you when you actually run it 
um, it, it will create a single thread um, and it will start executing the thread uh, in the main function if it's a C program or C++ program, right? So basically that means that these instructions here, if I go and run, if I compile this program and run it, it will start executing, you know, basically this if statement will be the first line of code that it runs from the compiled, uh, excuse me, from the compiled executable, all right? Um, so what pthread create does is it actually creates a thread as as the the name. So so the one thread is created automatically usually when you execute the program. So after calling pthread create, there's going to be two threads. Um, you know, and again, you need to have read, read chapter four here maybe to understand the the concept of uh, multiple threads within a single program, a single process. Right. So after this point, though, we have two threads. One thread is going to continue running. Uh, in the main, so one one thread, um, you know, will check if this fails and print um, an error message. But assuming it doesn't fail, one thread will be running in the main. We'll be running this loop down here, all right. But the other thread um, runs, uh, starts running um, at this function. Is as, is as if we're doing a function call, but we've got a separate thread of execution that's going to be running the thread function. Okay, so so the second thread is actually going to end up running this loop. And and since these are two separate threads. These can run concurrently, which means you know we might run a little bit of the, this loop, and we might get interrupted. Then this thread might get interrupted, and then the other thread gets to run for a bit and runs a bit of this loop, right? Or even if we have a true multi-CPU system, we could have this thread running on CPU one, uh, so we have true uh, actual parallel execution, and, and this thread running on CPU two, for example. So, um, but the point is, is yeah, these code, this code runs concurrently, um, you know, and, and, you know, concurrency can work even if you have a single CPU. So, so the main thing about concurrency is, is talked about <coughs> in chapter three and four um, is that we're, we're switching between two different threads of execution, right? So, so we can run this thread for a bit uh, and get interrupted and then run a bit of this code in this other thread for a bit and, and switch back and forth between them. Um, so the result of these running concurrently is um, you'll see, uh, you know, so so the, the the thread in main prints out O every time it gets to this line of code and then the loop. And, and the, the question is, I gave it to you, this loop should run 20 times, right? Um, since we've hard coded 20 in here. Uh, and, and so these O's are happening whenever it gets to that line and outputs um, an O in the main thread. Likewise, the this thread is also running this loop 20 times, but it prints out the, the dot here. Okay? And here's kind of my first hint on this question. You know, it's absolutely not um, a problem or not suspicious that sometimes it looks like the, in this case, the dot. So, so the, um, the, the second thread in the function runs twice in a row, and sometimes the, the thread in main with the O's runs twice in a row. I mean, you can even see three, four, five loops in a row, okay? So that, that's not unusual. You, you shouldn't be expecting exact interleaving where it always runs one loop um, from one of the threads and then switches over and runs one loop for the other, right? Um, But the, the thing is, is that, um, and then as kind of my, my final description of this, and then uh, I'm not going to say any more about this um, question here, uh, is that there is a shared global variable. So both the, the thread, both this loop here in the thread function and this loop in main are doing something with that global variable. They're both basically adding one to it, right? But, you know, so one of the questions is kind of, is this what you expect or not, right? So I point out that, uh, you know, so, oh, um, after the end here, so, so that, that output is coming here. So basically, there's one more pthread function here, pthread join. So this causes the, the, the main thread to, to pause here until all uh, threads that were forked off uh, are finished, right? So, so basically, uh, we won't move forward here until we're certain that um, the, the, the code in this thread is finished as well. So, um, but, but yeah, that, so then we get here. But, but notice that um, in this output, you see 21, okay? So somebody asked a question, um, when does the, the spawn child thread start execution of the function? 
uh, does the, the child thread start the execution of the function automatically or is it explicitly called? Um, so it, it kind of starts, at, um, I guess, automatically from um, what you're asking on the question here. So basically, um, I mean, uh, where am I? So basically in main here, since we call p thread create, I mean, this is an example of an op of, of a, uh, a system call that goes to the operating system. It, it goes to the p thread library, but but then it ends up calling some operating system um, um, system functions in order to fork a new thread within the process here. So this this call actually returns twice, um, you know, once in the original thread and once in the new thread that was created. And then both of those threads then uh, exist and are being managed by the um, operating system at that point. And so the operating system makes a decision about, you know, thinking back to the, 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 the process state model. So, so the same thing happens when you're doing multi-threading. So you can think of individual threads as processes as are talked about in chapter uh, three, okay? So now that I have two threads, the operating system might be running one of the threads, you know, currently where the other thread is ready, you know, and this thread, so anytime, so another kind of hint, anytime you do a sleep, sleep is another example of the system call. So sleep causes the, the, the thread to be blocked waiting on a timer. Um, so it sets a timer for one second um, and it puts the thread into a blocked state. So when this thread comes in a block state, again, like if you think of having only a single CPU, uh, that might that gives the operating system control again since it's blocked this thread, um, and it might go over and select this thread to run until it also sleeps and blocks. So, all right, does that make sense? So yeah, so that's kind of what's going on here. Let me see if oh yeah, I seem I did I did have a problem starting up here. I don't know what happened. Uh, let, me, let me just kill that, start again here. Although, let me check. Yeah, still not up. Huh. Hope my death box didn't die here. So, just in case it was um, kind of just a partial start, I'll, I'll try and force it to shut down. I'll try and bring it up again here, so. Um, as as I've, I've mentioned in the videos, um, I mean, you shouldn't normally use the VirtualBox GUI, but if you're having problems, sometimes it can be helpful. Um, so I'm just going to bring that up here. So I've got a bunch of other virtual machines, but in particular, it's trying to run this. But uh, in particular, sometimes you can get some more information by showing the um, um, the console. Uh, if I can find it. Uh, That seems to be booting up the console here. Okay, yeah, I think it came that time. So let's see, yeah. Okay, so yeah, that, that I don't know what happened the first time, but that that's a normal startup. So we got the port being forwarded, um, and then we've mounted our shared folders. Uh, everything looked good, so hopefully I should be able, good to connect to it now. So yeah. Uh, although, you know, it can take a little bit of time uh, even after you've gotten to that point for the um, um, for the Visual Studio Code service to come up. So let's give it a little bit more time. Um, am I using the wrong port number? Oh, I know. I was, I was talking to another student. I might be serving this on my... Um, um, <laughs> the report number here. So there it is. So um, I mean, yeah, you should normally be using 127, but I kind of changed my IP address. Okay, there we are. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to show just real quickly that you, I mean, you can, you know, you don't have to just read the code. You can actually execute this code and try things out to better understand it. So let me go ahead and close this 
folder here. This is the assignment one I was talking about last uh, Thursday. So close the folder. Um, so if you look, do an open folder. If you look in the um, sync uh, example, there's some examples here from, for problem set two, problem set four, um, some other things that I might talk about in some of these help sessions. But the, the problem set two one has um, um, some versions. Uh, the, the one called problem set two race um, should be, it might have some slight differences, I can't remember, but this should be basically the same as the, the code in the problem set. Um, Um, yeah, so it's looping 20 times here. Well, hopefully everything's the same as what I gave you on the written problem set. So um, I can't remember that the keyboard shortcuts might not be working here. Let me try it. Um, yeah, um, I probably don't have it configured. I, I don't have the, um, uh, the thing set up for the keyboard shortcuts and stuff, uh, which I probably should get in there. But, but uh, you should be able to, you probably have to, to uh, build this by hand if you want to try this out. So in particular, if you open up a terminal, uh, you can always, uh, I've shown this before, you can always, if you're having problems using the keyboard shortcuts uh, or configuration for the projects, you should be able to always do the build system from a terminal using the command line make command. So um, doing a make on this directory should build all these. Um, so in particular, um, there's an executable called PS02, and, and yeah, to run it, you'll also have to run it by hand. Um, but you can do dot slash PS02, problem set 02 to, to run the executable. Um, and you should see that, you know, um, you'll get a similar thing. Um, again, it might look pretty often like it's doing exact interleaving, but that's not necessary. That's, that's nothing um built in so you know it, it, there's nothing that requires it to always execute the main thread followed by the uh the uh thread function thread and and, and exactly interleave them but uh, but you'll often also get you know 21 here so um um another thing i think sleep only takes integer value so um if you want to I mean, you can try playing around. So you could, uh, if you like comment out the sleep um, on both the, the, the function and the main thread um, and rebuild it. Uh, so now, since it's not calling sleep, um, it won't actually uh, return, give control back to the operating system and put the thread into a block state, right? So, so, so here, yeah, it's a general question. What do you think, how do you think that will affect what happens if you run it now? Most likely, uh, what I'm thinking is, you know, since, I mean, you know, the loop happening 20 times is gonna be very quick. So probably um, it'll actually be able to execute all 20 times of this loop and it won't get interrupted um, by the operating system for a timeout or something like that, right? So most likely I'll see all of one thread execute followed by all of the other thread executing. So if we just do a make, it'll only rebuild what was out of date. So you'll see it only rebuilds the, the problem set two from the problem set two race. Um, and we can execute it there. So, so notice um, also we got a different result for my global equals there. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, what I was saying was kind of true. It, it, it executed everything in main first so basically because all those o's happened it actually hit all this loop and actually came down here probably but um, it didn't continue on because um, the p thread join will cause this main thread to pause here until um, um, my thread finishes and it can join them back together into one thread basically so at that point um, the, the this main thread became blocked and the operating system um, scheduled the, the the function thread to run and you saw it run it's 20 times um, um, one other thing um, another thing that might be um, 
useful to try and play around with is to sleep, but to sleep for a uh, uh, smaller amount of times. Um, and I'm just drawing a blank on the name of that system called, uh, um, I think, I think it just might be micro sleep. Um, so let's see if I can find it, remember it here. Yeah, I think it's you sleep, but um, um, I should be, I you know, I should probably be showing you guys doing this from the. Um, um, command line from the man pages but but yeah so there that's kind of what i was looking for so yeah, if we include this header we should be able to call the you sleep um system call which allows you to sleep in um microseconds i believe so which are million billions of a second so um uh, uh, oh yeah i'm already including you standards so So we'll try micro sleep, sleeping for a thousand microseconds. I'll go ahead and put that into both places here. And we'll rebuild it and try it out. So notice, you know, it went a lot faster, but notice we got back to kind of having um, a different result for the global and, and we didn't get exact interleaving, right? Uh, uh, and you can play around with that. So we could have maybe one be blocked for 10 times the amount of the other one, right? So here we'll favor the, if, if I leave it for this one blocking for 10,000 microseconds, but this one blocking for 1,000 microseconds, this one will be able to execute them um, a lot more, right? So you see main executes uh, quite a few iterations in between while the, the other one is sleeping for the longer, the, the, the function is sleeping for long periods of time. So. Um, all right. So yeah, that problem set is due today. Any, any questions on that? I think that was all the hints that I was going to um, give on that, unless somebody wants to ask a question there. So, so two questions, make certain you answer, you know, address both of these questions. Yeah, you know, and and you know, uh, try and use regular written English. So I'm looking for full sentences, you know, um, I'm, uh, uh, capitalization and things like that. So, but yes, like for the second part, make make certain you explicitly uh, answer the questions. You know, is this the output you would expect? Um, if not, what's gone wrong, and and how would you fix it? Those kinds of things. All right. Um, so unless uh, anybody has a question here, um, let's also, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. I'll talk a little bit, get started on the second programming assignment as well. So the second programming assignment is due um, on Thursday. So let me go ahead and open it up. for my sync um, assignment, assignment two. Um, so this one has probably been set up. Um, you know, so we've got the .vs code, so it should have all the keyboard shortcuts working on this one. Probably if I just copied this VS code to the example, PS directory, it would would get the the keyboard shortcuts and things, but uh, but yeah. So anyway, as usual for starting an assignment, you know, always make certain the build system is working. So Control Shift One or make clean should clean up everything. Control Shift Two should build everything. 
uh, do a make all and control shift three should be running the test, but um, test will be failing here. Um, one, one real quick thing, uh, I'm not certain if I showed this before or not, but the, the, there might be enough of these tests that it might scroll past, uh, scroll past the capacity of the, the default number of lines in the, the terminal output buffer here. You know, so, you know, if, if you scroll all the way to the top and you don't see um, the very first test being run and failed, uh, you might have to check this out. So it, it, you should be able to set that. So if you go to your settings and search for probably like buffer or something um, and, and look for the uh, maximum amount of lines in the, uh, the integrated scroll back. Uh, yeah, I hadn't. So, so I guess maybe there's less than a thousand, but for other assignments that might not be quite enough. So it might be a good idea to find that setting and increase that. I usually go up to 10,000, that should be enough for, so you don't scroll, um, don't lose the top of your output buffer when you run the tests here. So, um, all right, anyway, you have to say, so the way settings work in Visual Studio Code is it, it immediately takes effect when you set that, so. So I should have 10,000 lines now in my buffer when I run my um, um, when I run my tests here. So. All right, so let's look at the assignment um, uh, task then here as usual. Um, so, so here, another question. Um, so the expected output. Uh, oh, uh, okay. So, so you're 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 going back to the um, um, uh, problem set question here. So yeah, I mean, you know, here's here's the output that you see, uh, or the output if you compile it and run it yourself. I mean, is is that what you would expect or not? Is is what it's asking there, right? So are there any surprises there? Um, so to answer that, I mean, you have to kind of look at the code um, 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 and, and um, you know, concentrate on, you know, is that the expected value you, you see in my global? Um, I already told you that it's not, it shouldn't be surprising that you're not seeing exact interleaving. Um, all right. Um, all right, so back to the second assignment. Uh, let's open up the description here. I'll just open up the markdown file here in Visual Studio Code. So, um, So we'll go down here to uh, to the unit test task. So, oh, um, uh, yeah. So, in general, what this um, simulation is doing, we're going to be simulating basically the, the basic um, uh, dispatching process of a of a five state model. Although we're mostly working with the ready, running, and block, so the three main ones. But 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 you do have to do something. So so in this assignment, you have to create um, a, a process control block. And then you have to, uh, we're, we're going to be implementing member methods of the simulation called process simulator in this assignment. So we're going to be implementing member methods in order to simulate processes uh, being in the ready state, processes becoming um, blocked when running, so going to a block state, or processes time, be timed out. So we're also going to be doing uh, a round robin scheduler here. So, so we have to keep track of whether a process has uh, exceeded its time slice quantum. Um, and if it has, it should be timed out. Or if, if a block event occurs while process is running, in which case it should go into a block state, things like that. So, um, so yeah, the input files look something like this. So they're, they're just a list of events, one on each line. So if we look at the process events one.sim file, um, 
basically what happens in the simulation, uh, the new happens. So that means that a new process was requested to be created um, and add to the system. So we're always going to start with process identifier of one. So the, the first new will create a process with a PID of one. Um, and then three CPU cycles happen, followed by another new. So then process, I, process two ends up being created and a few more cycles. Um, so for example, uh, In this result file, um, this is the output uh, from a working simulation where we have a time slash quantum of five, which means that after a process runs for five cycles, it, it will, it will um, time out, right? So basically what, what happens uh, after, the, after each one of these events, we output the state of the system uh, in the simulation. So, um, so after we process this new event, um, the, the, the time slice quantum is five. There's one new process. No process is finished yet. Uh, there's nothing running on the CPU. So the CPU is currently idle. Uh, that As a result of creating that new process, there's one process in the ready queue. Um, and since it was the first process, it ended up with a process ID of one. Um, its state is ready. Um, it started at system time one, um, um, and it's used zero. Uh, it hasn't used, it hasn't run any CPU cycles and it hasn't run any CPU time slice quantums yet. So, and it's not waiting on any event currently. So that's kind of what the state means here in the output. Uh, and no process is currently blocked. Okay, so the block list is empty as well, right? So here then, uh, when we run a CPU cycle, basically all that happens is that we simulate process one. Well, okay, not, not the only thing that happens. So CPU was idle. So when we run a CPU cycle, we see that the CPU cycle, so the dispatcher tries to um, dispatch a process, which means it looks and sees if there's any process currently ready, which there was one process. Um, it, it selects the process at the head of the ready queue um, to become the running process. So, so as a result of the CPU cycle, process one went from a ready state to a running state. So it's now the one running on CPU, there's nothing in the ready queue, nothing on the, our blocked list here. But also this, this result shows the, the state of the system after we simulated the CPU cycle. So now, not only did we dispatch process one, uh, but um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's used one clock cycle and it's used one time slice quantum, right? So those both went up. Um, so then we have two more CPU cycles happen in the simulation. So after the second CPU cycle, um, I mean, process one was running. So the dispatcher doesn't actually get called, but we simulate. So now process one has used two time slice quantums. And the third CPU cycle has used three time slice quantums. And at that point, after three cycles, uh, a new event occurs. So now uh, the, the, the system time is still four. Uh, and we've still got process one having done three cycles, but now we've created the new process two. So now we've got process two uh, has entered the system is on, is on the ready queue uh, in a ready state. So then um, um, on the fourth CPU cycle, uh, which is shown here, um, Remember, the time slice quantum is five, so we haven't exceeded our time slice quantum yet. So process one just runs its fourth um, time step. Uh, and then on the fifth um, CPU cycle, simulated CPU cycle, um, at that point, um, process one will run its fifth time slice quantum, right? So um, it will exceed, since we're using five as the, the system time slice quantum here, um, at that point, um, it times out, right? So, uh, so, so here you'll see after the fifth CPU cycle, process one timed out, it got returned to the end of the ready queue. So, so the order of, of the processes on the ready queue here uh, is meaningful. So, so the, the process at the top is at the head of the ready queue and the process at the bottom will be at the tail or the end of the ready queue here. So now after the fifth cycle, uh, process, five, process five, uh, sorry, process one is used five um, total time steps. So, so it's used as five, but it got returned back. So, um, so we, we reset its time size quantum to zero in anticipation of the next time it gets scheduled on a CPU 
to keep track of its time slash quantum used um, during the current run, right? So that was our fifth CPU cycle. So now when we do the next CPU cycle, uh, the CPU was idle. So uh, the dispatch will get run. Um, so it will schedule process two to be the one running on the CPU since it's at the head of the ready queue. Um, and it will run for one cycle. So we'll use one CPU cycle and one time slice quantum, right? Um, and then we'll run another CPU cycle um, here. And then finally, um, we'll show the block and the unblock happening here. So um, for a block event, that's how we simulate processes uh, doing some IO and becoming blocked um, instead of um, um, timing out. So um, when we block on event 83, it causes the running process to go from the re running state to the block state. So process two is now um, in a block state. Um, uh, we reset its time slash quantum to zero. Um, and uh, now, since it's in a block state, we keep track of what um, event it's waiting on. So we just use integer numerical event IDs, right? These don't really mean anything in the simulation, but if, if it makes sense, you can think of this meaning that it's, it's waiting on a read from disk two or something like that, whatever these event IDs map to, right? So it's blocked waiting on event ID 83 to occur here. Uh, and then, so we have two more CPU cycles, um, but at this point, you know, process two is blocked. So the, the next CPU cycle causes process one to be dispatched from the ready queue and start running. So it's running its second time on the CPU, right? So, you know, it, it's already used five. So now it's run its sixth total time, but that was its first time slice quantum for the second time it was scheduled um, on the CPU here. Um, and it runs a second time here. Um, and then the unblock occurs. So this, this is simulating um, the uh, event happening. Um, and any, any process that's waiting on event 83 should become unblocked and be put back to the ready queue. So here, as a result of unblocking on event 83, process two um, is unblocked um, is put back to a ready state. So it's back on the ready queue. All right, and then we have a few more CPU cycles. Oh, I guess there is one more event. So, um, so two more CPU cycles causes process one to use its third time slice quantum and its fourth time slice quantum. Uh, but we can also simulate processes exiting the system from the done event here. So when the done event occurs, process one was the one that was running. So this means that process one did like a, an exit from the system. So it called exit um, or something like that. Um, so at that point, you know, uh, with the done process one exits the system. So we've actually finished one process and we don't see process one on the ready or blocked queue anymore. So it's it's actually in, an, in a done state or an exit state, right? Um, and then, yeah, for the next CPU cycle, um, only one process is currently ready, so it gets dispatched and becomes the ready, the running process. So. <coughs> All right, um, questions about that? That's the basic thing that's happening on the simulation for um, the second assignment. So, as as we did for the first simulation, then um, if you complete these tasks, it should mostly um, end up, you end up having a work in, working simulation of this process, um, round robin process simulator here, going through the block ready running states and done state, I guess, so. Um, so for the first, task, um, and maybe I'll show you the, the, the first one. Again, it's meant to be a little bit of a warm up, so you have to finish some of the getter methods. Um, so, um, Uh, 
So uh, let's let's just go. Let's look at the uh, the tests here. So um, let's look at the test for the first test case. Um, So when you first start the assignment, the first failing test is actually at line 145. So, so the, um, uh, the, the, the first test case is just testing stuff that's already implemented for you. So actually you have to skip over the first test case uh, and find the first failing test. So the first failing test um, um, happens down here um, at line 145, okay? Because you have to implement the get time slice quantum, the get next process ID, um, and these other getter methods, okay? So just a little word about this. So in these tests here, notice we create, outside of the test case, we create a, a simulator, a process simulator. Uh, the parameter that you pass in here, that specifies the time slice quantum for the simulation. So here we're specifying that the time slice quantum should be five. Um, for the for the simulation that we're going to run here, right? So then, so if you ask, get what is the time slice quantum? If you ask to get the time slice quantum, it should return five, but it's not doing that. It's, it's returning zero, right? So um, so if we look at the process simulator, um, the HPP and CPP files. Um, you'll find that there's a class like an assignment one uh, called process simulator this time where we define a bunch of member private member variables. Well, a few, uh, including the time slice quantum, the system time, next process ID, uh, num finished processes and things like that, all right? Um, and what we're doing, uh, here, I think I'll go and split my screen here. What we're doing here is we're calling the constructor that takes uh, the time slice quantum here. So we, we create an instance of a of our process simulator that we call sim, uh, and we call it with a five. So we're actually passing in the time slice quantum that should be used for the simulation here. So let, let's let's look at um, that constructor here. Um, um, so yeah, you actually do have to implement this uh, constructor here. Um, so I don't do anything. So that's part of uh, <coughs> part of task one. So for instance, um, um, so like I like I discussed a little bit before, um, um, the way I've got it set up initially here, there's some ambiguity. We're using the same name for the parameter as um, the um, the uh, member variable name in the the declaration of the process simulator class. So uh, so you can either rename the parameter or you can disambiguate it using the this pointer here. So here, if we um, assign the parameter to be our time slash quantum, we're going to use for the simulation. Um, so I'll go ahead and save that. Do uh, a make all to rebuild everything, and uh, Control Shift three to run our tests, but um, that is not com not completely enough to pass the first test because we're still returning zero here. Okay, so um, 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 if if you look, then uh, also we need you need to implement the um, getter methods, the get time slash quantum, get next process ID, um, and so on. Right. So um, yeah, if you look at the get time slash quantum, it's just um, hard code to return zero. So we instead need to return the time slice quantum, right? So here there's no ambiguity because we don't have a parameter or local variable, you know, um, um, a member variable called time slice quantum. So um, I don't have to disambiguate, but basically what I'm saying is return uh, this instance's member variable called time slice quantum as the result with the get time slice quantum here. So finally, yeah, if we rebuild, that should, um, you know, so, so you have to do, actually do two things to get that first test to pass. You have to uh, initialize the member variable using the parameter, um, and we have to return it from the getter method. So now if I run the test, Control-Shift-3, um, 
we're, we're, we're getting past 145 and the first one that we're failing is uh, 146 here, all right? Um, all right, and I'll do, uh, maybe I'll do one more. I'll now explain these other, so, you know, the system time keeps track of the simulated system time. So that should be initialized to, you know, zero or one. Um, next process ID. So whenever a new event occurs, you have to create a new process um, and add it to the ready queue, put it into a ready state and add it to the ready queue. Um, but um, um, should that should this should start off at one here, right? So um, um, you know, again, um, um, we had stubbed out to just return zero, but we should be returning the next process ID, but you do need to initialize that correctly. So we're expecting that the next process ID should start off at one when you start a new simulation. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we don't, we don't pass in a parameter for that. It should always start off that the next process ID is one. Yeah, and so on, right? System time should always start off at one. So yeah, we, we expect the system time to be one and so on. So if we re rebuild that and run our test now, we should be passing the first four, two tests now. Um, so we're passing the test at line 145, 146, uh, and now we're failing this at 147. To, Um, all right, questions about that? So hopefully that should be enough to get everybody this time to get past like the first task. So, although uh, there's one or two more, one or two more things um, that I'll mention here, it's already 254. Um, so let me, I mean, ultimately though, you're gonna actually have to create, oops, create like, um, I didn't, I didn't define it for you. So unlike the first assignment, you're going to actually have to add some stuff to the header file as well to, to the process simulator class. Um, so um, you might want to watch my videos about using the standard template library in C, C++. I've got that posted um, this week um, uh, where I talk a little bit more about the assignment. But in particular, just as an example, um, you're going to need like a ready queue. So you'll probably want to use like a list or a queue from the C++ standard template library to do that. Um, although, um, let me mention some other things. So there is already um, some things defined here in some other classes. Um, so uh, you, 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 if you want to, if you find it easier, you can add some code to like the process class. Uh, but you probably don't have to, uh, but you will have to use these classes. So, um, you know, if you look in here, um, there is a, um, a class defined called process. Um, so a process um, uh, is going to be the basic thing that we want to, we want, for example, when a new process, uh, when the new event occurs in the simulation, you'll need to create like a new process um, here. So I think this is kind of what we talk about. This is what you have to do starting with task two here. Um, so a process keeps track of things like the identifier for the process, the process state, the start time, the time used, things like that. So, um, And it's got member methods that you'll need to call uh, already kind of built into the process in order to get into the ready state. Um, or to time it out, um, uh, or, or uh, to make it the running process by dispatching it, or to uh, to time it out, put it back into ready state, um, and so on here. Uh, but um, your process simulator needs to to define and manage um, the processes. Okay, so. Um, So you might not ultimately want to do something like this, but but this is kind of like a first crack at this. So um, I could, 
for like task two, or, or actually maybe even uh, halfway through task one here. Um, we could do something like use a basic array uh, to keep track of processes that are created in the system. All right, so here, uh, like if I'm using just a regular array of 100 processes, um, I might wanna index this using the process ID. So we might just ignore process zero at index zero and, and use the process ID, the PID as an index into here, right? Um, so, so for example, for the new event, um, and, and we will start doing these in the second test case here. So, so after you do a new new event, you should find that the next the, the next press ID has been um, um, incremented. Uh, and that that we now have one active process. But you know the main thing is that you know you need like a process control block because you, you need to be able to implement the get process function, right? So if I ask to return the process uh, with a PID of one, um, it should return that process when you call get process here, right? So, you know, um, so, um, so here's the get process, and, uh, but, but let me show you like the, the new event here, or is the new, uh, I need to use the, um, use the outline here instead of scrolling around searching for stuff, oops. Um, so let's go, let's, let's look at the new event. Um, so it talks a little bit about what you need to do to implement like task two. So in particular though, um, um, as I started doing here, if we're using the, um, um, if we're using like just a, a, an array of processes, um, we know that the, the, the next, process ID uh, is the ID of the next process that we're supposed to create, right? So it should be one initially uh, before the, the first time that the new event is called. Uh, so for example, you know, I, I could access the array. If, I, if I'm using that as an index into my process control block, um, I want the process uh, at, you know, uh, the next process ID, which is which is one initially, uh, to be my new process here. Um, so, um, um, if you're doing a table like that, you really don't have to do anything. But but um, uh, you might need to do things like initialize that. So so put that process into ready state, put it onto your ready queue, right? So. Um, So I could do something like that, access that process. So, so th th that process, that process ID one, so, so after I've got that process, you know, I do need to increment. So one of the things the new event should be doing, um, you know, when we looked at the tests uh, here is, um, oops, not too much open here. I can't quite see everything, um, where'd my test go? I'll just open them up again here. So, um, so one of the things, you know, the, the next the, the process ID should be to set incremented to two, you know, after the new event happens. Um, the the process needs to be put into a ready state. So, so you know, so since 
the, the way I just kind of started for you, and again, this is just to get you started. You might not ultimately want to go with the solution here, but um, since the um, um, this array is an array of process instances, um, you know, um, I can uh, um, call anything. Um, so, so these are actually processes in here. So I could make it ready by calling the ready function, just as an example. Right. So, so, you know, so, since um, process control block is, is an array of processes, if I get the one at index one out of here, um, I can call all those things um, um, that you see in the um, um, process header. Right. So, so, so processes can do things, you know, that it, uh, processes keep track of all this information. Um, Um, but um, but but yeah, so we can initially make it ready by calling the, the, the ready function on it. Um, and you will also have to put this onto a ready queue. That'd be the last thing that I'll mention here. But but yeah, if we do that, that should be enough, for example, to be able to implement the um, get process um, function. And I pretty much kind of showed get process there, right? So um, um, what the... Um, what the get process is doing um, if we go back and look at our tests again here um, so when we when we call the get process function, we're expecting if we press in process ID one, we should get back that that process that we uh, initialized and put into a ready state, right? So we're actually getting a, a, an instance of a process back from there, right? So um, uh, oh, there is some stub uh, code in there, but uh, but once you have your process table, you know. Um, Um, again, you know, I, I don't necessarily recommend using a static array like this, but but you know, as we've as I've gotten started here, just to show you an example, um, you know, if I want to get the process and I'm using the PID to index it, um, I can just access my my array to get that. Um, um, and you know, that's the one that I want, right? So if I'm asking for process ID one, I'm I'm managing them in this array called process control block. Um, so I can access that and return that, um, which is what's being expected from the get process function, all right? Um, and then kind of as a final hint here, um, kind of like for task two or task three, uh, you in order to implement the dispatcher correctly, you're going to have to have like a ready queue and like a ready list or a blocked list. Um, 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 so like, for example, for ready queue, you really should be using um, uh, standard template library uh, containers like the queue container. Um, you probably have to include um, Um, Q, if you want to use a Q, um, like that. Okay, so um, although, you know, you have to be careful here. So uh, if I'm passing on uh, full process objects, um, so, you know, if you do like a, so, so now ready Q is actually a standard template library Q container here. So you can do things like push items onto the Q and pop them from the Q. Uh, but yeah, if you push processes on there, it's going to make copies of your processes. So that can cause problems. Be aware of that. So, you know, if you end up, if you push like a whole process on here, it'll make a copy of the process. And then when you pull that back off, it might not be the same process. So another approach is you can just um, 
make queues of process identifiers, right? So then if you, you can just push the process identifier of the pro of the new process when it's created to put it onto the ready queue or push it on there if it gets timed out, right? Um, and then you can uh, pop or uh, dequeue that the, the process ID at the head and then use that as an index into your process control block. Okay, so that, that can in many ways be a cleaner solution. Another solution um, um, is to use dynamic allocation and use pointers to processes. Um, and you could have uh, queues of process pointers here. So that's another approach you might think about taking, especially if you're comfortable with using pointers in C. So, um, all right. Oh, and by the way, you know, if you're confused, so what's a PID? That is um, 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 defined in uh, the process.hpp, I believe. There's like a type def, right? So, so, um, so if you've never used type defs before, it's really just a, another name for an unsigned int. Okay. So, but, but you know, this this is meant to make the code more readable. So you'll see uh, in the process class and in the simulator class that uh, we refer to either P to PIDs or times or event IDs. These are all just unsigned ints, right? So, so a process ID identifier should be uh, like a an integer value um, and it should be one or greater, right? So really it shouldn't even be zero, but um, um, one, two, three, four unsigned ints um, we use for process IDs. It's the same for like times or event IDs. Um, all right, so yeah, it's already like uh, past three here. Uh, anybody have any kind of questions? That was kind of all I wanted to cover um, um, at this point on the, Assignment two to get you started. Anybody want to throw out a final question here before I kind of end the meeting? If not, um, I'm going to go ahead and end the session here. I'll post this as usual on our class playlist in case you want to uh, rewatch it to go back over some things. Uh, you can always send me questions by email. Um, so, um, yep, so that's it for the session. Um, and I will see you guys later then.